Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we look at your word that you would give us um, the sight and perspective that you want us to have. We ask not just for an understanding of the text. Uh, we, we ask not just for uh, a great point or two from this message, Lord. What we ask is that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts. That you would communicate us the very thing we need today and for the days to come. That we would see you clearly. I thank you for everyone who is here. I thank you um, that you brought them here safely. Whether they're in town or coming from far off. That you have purposed them here today. Thank you. I pray that we regard this day. Not just as Father's Day. Not just as a, as a, as a day to... Uh, to celebrate um, other things in our in our history and our and our national society, but this is a day that we understand first and foremost that you gave us this day, and I pray that we don't take that for granted. That every day that we have is just another day, but it's a day that we didn't necessarily have to have, but you have um, given us. This time in history, this day, to breathe and to think and to hear from you, and I pray that uh, we would use it um, for good, that we would use it for your glory. I pray for those who are not here with us, for those who are ailing, for those who are um, off visiting or um, whatever they may do, Lord, that you would keep them, that you would be their strength this day that you would bring if they require healing that you would bring healing that if they require comfort or strength that you would um, fill them uh, with your spirit that they might um, be bold and be strong this day and i pray lord that in the things that we have done that maybe have not been um, according to your will lord that um, you would in jesus forgive us and restore us, cause us to stand where we have stumbled, that we might walk each day closer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 28 uh, is, is a pretty short psalm. Um, I like short psalms because I can preach the whole psalm in one sermon. Um, that's not the only reason, but it's, it's nice to look at a psalm and kind of see all the parts there in just a few verses. Um, so to begin this, I want to, of course, naturally share with you a dream I had, because <laughs> that just seems a natural thing to do. Um, in this dream, I was standing over a, a river of sand. By river of sand, I mean that it was not just a a bed of sand, but it was moving like a river would. If you can picture, instead of water, it was sand. And just billions of grains of sand just going by. And, and I was looking at this, and, and again, this is, you know, dreams are kind of weird anyway, and my dreams fit that category. Um, I, I think I dream in Portuguese because I kind of know what's being said, but I don't really hear a language going on, right? And I'm recognizing that this river of sand uh, are lives. This is history. They're just a bunch of lives going through, right? And, and I was standing there and saying, I want to see my life. Where am I? You know, where am I? And then I see this, this little red speck, this one grain of sand that's red. I guess that's how I could tell, you know. And I said, oh, that's me. And then it was gone. Right? And I said, where did it go? And a voice from someone said something like, um, well, that, that was your life. It was here and now it's gone. I'm not sure that's exactly what it said. I didn't have the subtitles on. But that is the idea that I had in my head that in this vasty I had to look really hard to see and only because it was red could I identify that that was my life and I just as soon as I saw it it was gone and I think that dream um, that I had 
applies a lot to us in how we look at life and how we look at our faith, our religion, how we look at the Bible, right? I think a lot of the content that we hear about Christianity has to do with you know, how God relates to us. You know, even in real good gospel conversations, you know, what has Jesus done for you lately type of thing, right? And how you can improve. We're looking at that one speck, and, and that's reasonable because that context ourselves is pretty much the natural context we have, right? And we don't know everything about the world and the universe and everybody else that's going on, but we kind of know, we think we know what's going on with us. At least it's easier to relate everything to us, right? And how we perceive it, how we think about it, how we feel about it. You know, whether it's good, bad, whatever. We gauge it by our own context. But the reality is we're just one grain of sand in this story that is a river of sand. And how great it would be for us to not only understand Christianity or what God is doing in our lives according to just one little grain of sand going down the river, but instead to, have to understand the whole plan, to see the course of all the sand, to know from where it came and to where it's going. That would be great, but that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard. Fortunately for us, Scripture provides both of those things. They provide for us a way to understand Jesus as he pertains to us, as we meet him, because it is a personal meeting. It is, you know, Jesus is a person, he's not a motto, right? And yet, the Bible also gives us a picture that goes far beyond us. And we appear at it in places that we don't expect. So, Psalm 28 is one of those psalms. I really built it up now. I, I'm sure it'll deliver. Right? To you, O Lord, I call. This is David. And a lot of um, Bible commentaries, people that spent their lives uh, analyzing these kind of things, believe that this psalm may very well be the time when David's son Absalom was rebelling against Israel, against David, who was... Uh, the king and, and Absalom was his son and he led people that uh, rebelled against his father and he's praying this to God I call to you my rock I ask you do not be deaf to me that is hear my cries lest you be silent to me if you are if you don't listen to me and answer my prayer um, I might become like those who go down to the pit um, or dragged down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Um, that phrase, most holy sanctuary, it's very debated what it means. Um, it doesn't mean most innermost sanctuary. It means in the back of the sanctuary. That's literally the Hebrew of it. And it's, it's like as, as deep as I can plea with you, Lord, if you kind of think of um, think of an actor, a very famous actor, or if you're into opera, a diva, you know, singer, or whatever it is uh, that you conjure up, think of that kind of person. And if you were to ask them when they're around a whole lot of people a question, they would just give you kind of a pat answer or whatever. But if they were in the back room, relaxing, being themselves, and you were able to have access to that and just sit and say, hey, what do you really think about this? They would give you the most heartfelt answer, right? Because they're themselves. That's the idea of this. God, when you are your most godness to me, personalness to me, when I come to you in that way to hear your heart, and his prayer is this, do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. You know, if this is Absalom, then he's talking about, do not cause me to suffer destruction like what is to come to those who 
act like good people, act like neighbors, act like brothers, but they are devising evil in their hearts. Give them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. He's saying, Lord, let them reap what they sow. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. This is kind of like our prayer of lot, right? You know, when we think we're very righteous, we're like, hey, you know, I'm not going to react to you, but the Lord's going to get you. <laughs> we have this kind of inside, Lord, did you see that guy over there? Write his name down. And the reason why, because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the works of his hand, he will tear them down and build them up no more. And that is, they, uh, they're on their way up. And verse 6 turns more to blessing. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. So this is kind of a response. He's given the own, his own response. I know he has heard my pleas for mercy, because the Lord is my strength. And my shield, in him my heart trusts, and I am helped. So there's confidence right away that what he prayed, God's going to take care of. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart then re exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. And really, the two verses we really is pay a lot of attention to is these last two. The Lord is the strength of his people, or really... Um, in the Hebrew, the Lord is their strength. His people is there to uh, make it clear what they think the translation would be. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. So just kind of a few little technical notes, maybe just a couple. Um... The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Uh, the language that, that's being used here, uh, I'm going to try to make this really simple. It's something that's called a, a common plural. His people. It's what, the Lord is, is their refuge. When he is talking, he is using a, a word that's used in other places, and, and as a, as a, actually quite a bit in the Old Testament. When it's referring to one group, um, but that group is representative of many people. He might even be talking about when he says his anointed. It's a form that means his anointed one, but that anointed one um, implies many people in that one. Does that make sense? Santa Cruz Community Church is one church, yet there are many people here. That's the idea. You say, what, why is that important? It's super important because of what I'll tell you later. So you just got to wait. And then he gives, in verse 9, this kind of um, four, four imperatives. You know what an imperative is? It's like, do it now! You know, type of command thing. But they're in different Hebrew stems. And so I'm not going to explain the stems. I'm going to explain kind of the feel of it. The first one, the um, save your people, um, is is a reflect. It's cause your people to be saved. And the second is bless your heritage. And that's that's in a emphatic bless your heritage. The third one, be their shepherd, is in a kind of common as the everyday goes. Be continue being their shepherd. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. And then carry them forever is emphatic. What this is implying is that there's an action that leads to a definitive result or definitive conclusion. That's, that's what you're supposed to get from this poet, poetic form. If you save your people, they will be blessed. Your heritage will be blessed. No question. That the blessing is that you are saved. And we use uh, in society today that, that uh, you know, you hear that a lot. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Um, and, and good people use it in good ways, in sincere ways. You know, Steph Curry used that a lot this week. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. We're blessed to watch you, Steph. 
Um, but he's blessed. But, it, but the real sense of it is that the real blessing is being saved. Jesus said, what good is it to you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? The blessing is being saved. So save your people. Well, that's our great blessing. The second is, be their shepherd. If you are our shepherd, we know we are, will be carried forever. If you are our shepherd today, you are a shepherd forever. We will be carried. We will never be let down. We will never be tossed away. We will never be left undefended in a very emphatic way. So I just wanted to point that out to you. That the point of this is that the Lord um, will be the strength of his people. He's the saving refuge of his anointed one including many, okay, which is that he will save his people and they will be called blessed, that he will be their shepherd and they will be carried by him forever, or olam, for ages on end, right? Amen. So that's the message here. Now the curious thing is that um, David as he prays this, is identifying two people, right? I mean, other than the Lord. He's identifying um, those who are his people, who he will shepherd, whom he will save, and then these other people that he prays about. The wicked, the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. And so they're, so, yeah. and, and, and that's very distinct here, right? There are the good guys, and there are the bad guys. And the bad guys, David does not pray what he prays at the end of the psalm for them, right? He says, you know, all right, Lord, give them what's coming to them, right? And I find that really interesting. Because, you know, maybe we read this thing, well, that's kind of an Old Testament way of thinking. Of course, we today think in the Old Testament ways. A lot. We know what Jesus said. We'd rather not do that all the time. We'd rather say, well, look, you know, there's a very bad person, the Lord will take care of it. Right? And there's truth in that, that's in Scripture. But if you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll remind you right now, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, I'm at uh, verse 44 now, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you claim? What reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? You do, you do not even the Gentiles, the ungodly people, do the same. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And in that sense, a perfect is a, is a word that means complete, mature, and it refers to the, to the way God loves this is really important. God is loving you. And God also loves the person who persecutes you. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. Not as much. No, I'm just kidding. He, he loves them very much. 
In fact, we know in John's Gospel, he said that God loved the world so much in this way that he loved in that um, he gave his only son, his only one-of-a-kind son. And what's, what's, the, what's the gist of that verse? So that whoever believes in him might not be cast down into the pit, as David says perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Now, if we're back in Psalm 28, David might be, whoa, wait a minute there, Lord, you know. I just pray that they get what they deserve, right? <laughs> so, so who's right? Is David right or Jesus? Well, of course, we're going to say Jesus, but David's right too. David's right for the time in which he writes. Because the truth of the matter is that God is just as well as loving. And that he will repay each according to his deeds that he deserves. So we should all be fairly and very uncomfortable right now. Except that the difference between Psalm 28 and Matthew 5 is that Jesus happened. Because when we read through Psalm 28, who do we identify with? David, right? Lord, hear my, my cries, my pleas for mercy. You see these people, these ungodly ones who don't respect you, who don't treat people right, and they're bearing down on me, and I don't want to be carried away with them. I want you to single me out and, and stand for me and save me. And deal with them. Yeah, we relate to David. That, that's our prayer, right? Maybe somebody thinking, okay, well, really what we are is we are his people. We are the people under the David, right? And maybe Jesus is our David. And there, there's biblical correlation there. And we're his people. That, that we are the ones that David is praying for. Ultimately, that we would be included in God's provision for the king and that we would be cared for. Now, the option one that I said, we relate to David, is true. And option two, that we are the people, is true. But the core, if we really understood this, if we want to look at the river of sand, We are the wicked. We are the wicked. We are the ones who are born into this world not with God. Not of faith, not saved. We were the ones, if it weren't for the grace of God, we would be the most destructive people in this world. We are the ones when Jesus said, don't the Gentiles even do those things? That's us. Unless you are an Orthodox Jewish person of great faith, you are not included um, <laughs> as what David is talking about himself or the people. We are the wicked. You need to understand that. Now it gets kind of real because we don't identify necessarily with, uh, you know, we're Christians, we're good people, you know, uh, God has saved us. We come back to the real basic realization that when he prays, save your people, we're not among that yet in, in history. And the difference is that Jesus came to take us from verses, you know, 4, 5, and 6 into verses 8 and 9. To take us from being the wicked and the ones that, that naturally, you know, will say, hey, yeah, I got your back. And we're like, <clears throat> right? 
and devise evil in our hearts and think about our own circumstances. And that's still so many in the world today. That Jesus came to deliver those people. That's why we read in, in Matthew, we read, um, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And he's speaking to Jews at the time. So he's saying Gentiles, Romans. He's saying, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Jesus says, I'm going to the cross to die for them. To bring them into the family of God. Amen. So that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Why would you then be sons of the Father in heaven? Because you then look at others who are persecuting you, who are wicked or without God, and you have the love for them that the Father also has for them because of Jesus. And the thing you want most to see is Jesus to be exalted by saving this wretch. Just like he saved this wretch. And the way he did this um, is by going to the cross and dying like a Gentile, like a criminal on a Roman cross. Dying like someone who deserved to die, yet he didn't. Isaiah 52, at the end of 52 and 53, is commonly known as a, one of the servant songs. Talking about the servant who had come um, that would die in place or for the transgressions of his people. Verse 5 of Isaiah 53 He was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is before his shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. And by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And you hear that now in one of the beautiful parts of that servant song is the way that he refers to his people. That they would understand Isaiah 53 in, in the Old Testament, Israel as Israel. And Jesus says, no, my people are people who call me Lord, who believe and come to the cross and bow down and kneel. Those who receive grace, who were the wicked ones, the ones who had no hope, the ones who would be dragged down to the pit. I came to save them also. I came to save the Jews first, and the Greeks also, us also. And what that looks like to us is this. The summary is that the Lord is their strength. The Lord is our strength. In everything that we face, not only in our, on our little red speck of sand, in our context, 
but we are part of this river, and that whole river is the Lord is our strength. And the reason why the Lord is our strength is because he is our saving refuge of his people, of his one people. And that one people isn't a church, not a religion, a denomination, but that one people is found in the one person, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And all of those who have faith in him, who are found in him, get this, as they get saved. They are saved. And since he saves his people, we are blessed and we are his heritage forever. Not just blessed because of our daily circumstance. Not just blessed because things, yeah, we're in Santa Cruz. It's a beautiful day. Not just blessed that we're alive, but blessed because we are found in him and we will forever be called the people blessed. And he it will, is our shepherd. Not just when times are tough and when we get lost and says, hey, back over here. But forever, he will carry us. When we fall, he lifts us. When we can go no further, he carries us. And he is always with us and he will be with us until the end of the age when we will always then be with him. And so you see how David's prayer is not simply that he would, himself would be saved. You see how God uses this to point to the person of Jesus. See how God uses this to, to get out of just our vision of just ourselves and see that we are part of God's provision to carry all his little grains of sand home. And Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans that there is no power on earth that can frustrate God's plan. That when he has saved the people, they are saved forever. There is no one that can clutch you out of the hands of Jesus. And all these things were more than conquerors, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you pray with me? And as you do, I pray that that you are able to um, come before the Father, to come before Jesus and, and, and kind of step not only in your um, own ideas of how, what Jesus means to you, but see it in the bigger picture that he, God, has provided his son to take us from those condemned to those who have life forever because of his great love for us even when we were against him. And that our heart should ache for others also to see him. And our Father in heaven, we pray that we would have this heart, that we would be humbled by it, that we would be rejoicing because of it, that we would understand that it's not just a question of whether you will save us, or whether we'll make it through, but that if we are with Jesus, our salvation is sure. Thank you for such a great Savior. Thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.